one. This is from the outside. If you want to hear anything about web or whatever, you're in the wrong room. Um, given we have enough people who've probably done this in their past, I figured I'd start with a slide like this. Who has done like th something like this in the past? Right. I, ha I never have, not my world. For me, this is hard. And if I'm thinking in terms of 40 years and density of these pins and timing and all these things and what I can get out of them, um, it's probably become a lot harder these days to understand what's going on than it once was. However, we still have hardware support like to get out what's get going on in our CPUs. Um, JTAG Information Arm has the high-speed serial trace probes and, and 4 gig of buffer memory and you can get a decent state of CPU internals out if you're interested in them, but as I said, it's not my world and it has another drawback. I can't easily change it to see how things behave different <coughs> if I say like, give me half the cache size. Um, the development cycles and, and things are long. I've worked a bit with FPGAs and well, it's really not my world. So as a software person, I want something else. And software is easy, as we know. So the answer is use a simulator. And that's what happened to me in my third year, at the end of my third year of my PhD. And this is where this odyssey kind of started. The idea was we get the flexibility of the software. We can adjust the system as we need it. We'll wonder about how realistic the results will be. And it can't be that hard. So. After doing a lot of PMC work in between, I started to look at Gem5. So Gem5 is a software simulator for computer system architecture research, they say, which gives you an idea. It's hardware people using a software simulator to think about different hardware. I'm a software person. I want to understand my software and how it works on the hardware. So I look at this from a different perspective. That means, for me, I repurpose that simulator and the way people have been using it. So, another thing is software is harder than hardware. And Linux was running fine on Gem5. I'm a FreeBSD person. I'm standing here doing a FreeBSD talk. So, um, FreeBSD should just run. I mean, we do a modern hardware, more or less, as long as we support it. Um, so compile it, load stuff, run, analyze, done. That was the idea. So a bit more about Gem5 before I go into the FreeBSD bits. Gem5 has two different versions that you can use it. One is syscall emulation, so you just run your application on top of what you have. I've never done this. Don't ask me about it. And they do full system mode, which means you completely boot up your kernel, you run your user land, you go to full system environment as you would get in any other of the um, simulators or hypervisor systems or on bare metal. Um, they support a bunch of different architectures and pipeline models, and I'll come back to that in a minute. They have GPU modeling these days, memory subsystems, entire crossbar, caches, DRAM, snoop filters, whatever. You can plug them together and play with them. You can change timings, sizes, whatever. They do power modeling. Um, they support multi-core, which is something, and I'll say upfront, I've not been using. Um, they have a nice feature, which is checkpoint restore. So you can run up to a certain point because simulations are sometimes slow. Save your state, resume at a later point, or resume having changed some of the underlying hardware model, which gives you the flexibility to run different cases, um, but still saving the time. If you're doing it on, if they are doing it on Linux, um, they can fast forward. So if you're simulating ARM on ARM or Intel on Intel, you could, in theory, use KVM support to say just, yeah, boot all the way to user space until I can run my stuff, which takes you two, three seconds instead of two, three hours. Um, they are not cycle accurate. So 
if you want anything cycle accurate and, and rely on this, don't use Gem5. And the funny bit is it's implemented in C++ and Python, which got me a bit. So architectures and pipeline models, there are three major different pipeline models they have. Two are in order. The second one is coming from ARM, and it's supposed to work with some, for some people with x86. And you, you can guess what supposed to run means. I tried with FreeBSD, nowhere near. Um, and there's an out of order pipeline as well, which is the thing you mostly want. The reason it says OK-ish is, at the moment I have one workaround in FreeBSD. Well, the question is, is it a simulator bug or is it FreeBSD? Um, but apart from that, it works well. ARM mostly works well, um, and you'll hear about why in a minute. There is RISC-V support now. I have no idea if FreeBSD runs on it. It came lately into Gem5, and I've not had time to try it out. There used to be FreeBSD on Alpha, but um, yeah, FreeBSD on Alpha is long gone. So, um, so Linux just worked. What I learned a few weeks into this was the Linux versions they were using were ancient, as in like three years, four years, five years old. And that should have given me a hint. Um, the other thing is you give the simulator, so Gem5 opt, gets a bunch of command line options, as you'd expect, Beehive or whatever. One of them is the kernel. The reason you give it the kernel is like they do a simple lookup and everything. So in your traces, you will get like function names and everything. The problem is the way Linux does this is you load the kernel and the begin at the beginning of Linux, they do all the setup that we do in Loader. So if you try to load FreeBSD, a FreeBSD kernel directly into Gen 5, you go nowhere. So the problem was how to get to long mode, how to set up the page tables, all these things, which basically meant I had to implement the entire loader bits in Gem5 upfront, give it the kernel, do all these things, works fine. Um, so you think I can load the kernel, I can start running the kernel, it's all good. And then you hit all these things. And every time you hit one of them is, is it FreeBSD, is it Gem5, or is it me? The first thing is, you know, you find CPU ID stuff. They just say we have all these features. FreeBSD trips over them because it's just not there. Um, ACPI, really great in Gem5. It says, I'm here. I have nothing. Um, ATA, I gave up on to try to get it working and ended up doing Word IO. The IO pick, AA pick was fun because after the first index, all the index calculations in Gem5 were off, so your interrupts never worked. I have no idea how people ever tested this. Um, TLB and page table walker things were extreme fun, multiple times. This is the one workaround I still have in FreeBSD at the moment where we are not sure. Is it FreeBSD or is it um, gray area in terms of it's documented to be very lenient and the it's actually no it's documented to be strict but the cpus are very lenient and we might just make use of that feature but gem5 might be more strict and this is why it doesn't work but scraping all these things together like it takes time and lots of debugging arm was a lot easier mm, ruslan he's not here this year um, had done FreeBSD for Gem5 upfront. So for me, it was um, getting a few things sorted a year later. Uh, as you can see, most of them were minor initially. Uh, the FDT update from ARM helped a lot. Andy helped a lot. He's sitting somewhere in there. Um, and then FreeBSD interrupt, and she came in to all of this for me, and I took another week of month or how long did we take to sort this out? I don't know. It just stops you from doing your work. Um, and if you wonder how do you debug all these problems here, because you're dealing with this monster which is 
normally your CPU. Um, they have a lot of debugging options. You can turn them on individually, what you need, which is extremely helpful. It's also extremely helpful if you want to later on get an ISA level trace of all your instructions while you're doing software analysis. If you want to see what your caches are doing. Um, the problem is it's text output and it's only semi-structured lines. And I'll show you some in, on the next slide. The next problem is if you start tracing all the time from the beginning of your, from basically from power on, um, you can consume a lot of coffee until you get anywhere. So they have a nice feature which says start tracing at a certain point. For that you need to have a rough idea where that certain point in time will be, which means you start with very little or no tracing or until your panic happens, get the number, restart again with just tracing on slightly before and rerun. Um, the next line is something I'll explain a bit more later. I've added my own tracing, not just for these components, because sometimes it's not in the right place. But for the software analysis part, um, they weren't actually ready for that, for these things. So I've picked two random lines I could find somewhere. And I'm not sure if my mouse, no. OK. So the first thing you get is what they call a tick. It's kind of like, bless you, um, timer running. Um, then you get the component that is locking. In the first um, line, it's a tracing part. In the second line, this is system CPU thread zero, so first core. You get instructions here, um, given its user space, I guess. You don't have a function lookup. You get the decoded instructions. You get from memory. So you get like destination and address information. Um, for the tracing up there, you see, oh, this was a retired instruction. That's the PC. And in this case, it was a, an internal Gem 5 instruction, which is toggle tracing, which means that was the first line in a trace saying, OK, I turned tracing on. However, if you have to think you've got about 1.2 terabytes of those to get a kernel booted if you turn on full tracing. So if you want to find anything in there, it's a bit of a needle, uh, finding a needle in a haystack. And that's kind of what it looks like. <laughs> um, I've never printed out that much paper Com like in the last 10 years or so compared to the last months. This is just finding one TLB problem. It was initially 86 million lines of debug output and these 10 pages and annotations you can see is just um, the tip of the iceberg and that was 19 months into all of this debugging and getting it running. So sometimes you're sitting there and thinking this. What's going on here? Why is this not working? How are other people doing their research on this? I must be missing something. Some, something's not right here. And you start talking to people and, no, this is the way it is. This is the way they work. This is the way it is supposed to work. Um, I said I added my own tracing lines for software analysis. The best story I've heard was someone saying, we dumped statistic files every couple of milliseconds out of the simulator, and then we spent three months with object dumps trying to go back and try to correlate the statistic output to the actual program function that we were running. And I was like, right. You have software in front of you that you can change. And it took me like about three days to get my tracing in, which does the same thing. So you're, you're at a point where you start running things. You get output. You get numbers. So this is a couple of initial microarchitectural things and architectural things 
that I got out on a test run of, for RMB8. And you look at those numbers and think, OK, something in here is still not working. It's going to be another week or two of like, debugging and analysis. Why do I have like, almost 10 times as many fetches as I have instructions committed? These numbers don't make sense. And you start to do a bit more analysis, and you find, given, given you have full instruction traces and everything, you sort your PCs, you look at them, and you see, OK, these things happened like 5 million times. But out of the last, uh, this is basically a, a sorted list with the um, most often called PC at the bottom. You see, oh, this is all the same function. And then you walk into the office next door and talk with Andy. And he says, well, what function is it? You look up the function, and he goes like, yeah, um, where is it called from? And you say pmap enter after you've done another cycle of dissecting. And he's, he goes back and says, try this. And that's the initial thing. That's basically the first thing I found with Gem5 was that anom anomaly and that one line change from Andy um, gave us this on the same numbers. Our ITLB hits and our iCache hits went down by 44% using the change. Now you would think, wait a second, my hit rate in the cache goes down. That's not good. And that's a thing we need to be very careful doing PMC analysis um, because it's only half of the picture. The reason is, why does it go down? And the answer to that is because your instruction our instruction fetches went down by almost 40%, but the instructions committed went down by 20%. So we did a lot less work. And that basically meant um, Yeah, we had on a real system up to almost 30% at one point for a certain wor workload we tried. And the workloads were tiny little things, no, nothing big um, improvements. So it depends on the workload. The number may sound high, but you can expect general improvement with these things. And if you are 16 months into a project and you find something like this, you find a lot of motivation again. So I think in my description I said measuring the right thing is something I'm going to talk about. And this sounds like one of the other am I stupid kind of things. Now, if you have a full trace of what you're doing, you can fi finally or suddenly start to understand what's really going on. And you can look at it and see if what you think you're doing is what you're doing. Um, assume you have a very simplistic program. It forks off. You have a sender and a receiver. You have an inner loop. One of them just sends 100 packets. The other one just receives 100 packets. You want to trace from the first packet sent to the last packet received. Think of the code for a second. Turn on tracing before one. Turn on tracing when the other thing happened. Two different processes. And don't start your tracing too early. It took me four tries to get it right. This was like, woo. Um, I ended up doing a two-threaded version just because synchronization was easier. But um, it made me wonder if what we are if we don't do steady state tracing, as in like get our systems to steady state and look at them, um, if you are actually measuring what we think we are measuring. If you're doing these kind of things, if you're getting numbers out of a simulator, you start wondering, and, and you, know, you still have in mind, are these numbers right? You, you want to put in like, Secure checks to make sure they are good. So I have a question for you. 
if you have on one side all your layer uh, L1 cache misses, so everything the L1 can't serve, and on the other side you have all your L2 hits and all your L2 misses together, should these numbers add up or not? Arms up for uh, by everyone who thinks they should add up. One, two, three. Who thinks they should not add up? One, two, three, four. Yeah. Um, I wrote these checks initially. I changed them. Turns out, if you have, depends on your cache, it depends on your cache system, but um, in certain cases, if you have, say, a request for some data, beginning of a cache line, L1 doesn't have it, L1 goes off, L2 please give me. You're, you're doing prefetching, your next request comes in, adjacent data, next thing, same cache line. Your L1 says, oh, I have a request pending for that cache line already. Let's just wait for the result to come in. And it's not, you, you will never see it in the L2. Um, another thing, people doing PMC number stuff need to be aware of and careful. I know a lot of us are just doing LLC tracing for various reasons, so we don't really, ne we don't necessarily run into this, but it's something to, to think about. So I finally got to the point where I had my first experiment, and I decided I'm going to look at the overhead of BPF, um, compare BPF and BPF chit, because we have this chit in the kernel, which we don't use by default. And so you set up your experiment. Remember, it was three architectures, which was x86, armv8, and armv6, two pipeline models on each, like one in order, one out of order. You have your baseline, BPF and BPF chit, and given it's me, I do IPv6 as well, but you know, explaining IPv6 to some academics these days, so you still do IPv4, it's a nice comparison as well. That gives you 36 experiments. Um, I had 55 microarchitectural and architectural elements, whatever you call them, like iCache miss or whatever, that I was looking at, that gives you almost 2,000 numbers. And then we decided to not only simulate like cache sizes for the real machines that we picked for each model, but also to harmonize them across so we could compare. And for the interesting fact, like make them really, make really small cache, use really small caches and go down. So that's another times three. Given it's all academics and you want error bars, you to do 10 repetitions. Um, and then you want to see how BPF behaves differently, so you use a minimal and a maximum size filter that hits really late. Um, I think by now we are at 100, uh, 100 uh, no, yeah, 100,000, something like this. And then you do different packet sizes, you do TCP and UDP, and then you don't only want the plain packet send and receive, but some realistic workload, and you do an HTTP fetch, with an NGINX on the other side, and yeah, things get big. And you end up with a lot of data points that you don't necessarily know what to do anymore with. So you cross out a couple of things after staring at all the results for a while, but it's still way too huge. So along these lines, you find more bugs. <laughs> um, the BPF chit implementation that Ruslan had done, unfortunately, had, and I can't remember what it was anymore. Um, one of the cases was not right, and that was replicated for all the functions. Um, and an initial zeroing was missing, so some of the things didn't really work. Um, BPF mtab has a real nice comment inside which says XXX, we cannot handle multiple mbuffs, which is something you'll find the moment you do loopback traffic. Because BPF mtap2 will not even use the chit, because it'll, it'll prepend an extra mbuff and the front, and the chit can't handle this. So 
problem sheet, limited scope. So be careful. And then you look at your first set of numbers and you wonder, is that shit actually used? Because you don't see any difference. So you add a syscontrol to, to count the results. And I, this is just you know, one of the many plots that I initially stared at. And given you probably won't see much of this, I'll zoom in a bit on one of them. So this is ARMv8. We are looking at the iCache hit-miss ratio. You're seeing the hit bit on the top. It's the out-of-order pipeline. We've got V6 on one side, V4 on the other. And then you have the three different kernel versions or usage versions. One is no BPF, one is BPF, and then the last one is BPF chit. And um, there are a few things that I see immediately, which is these round circles of the top. This is outliers. And that means in one of your 10 repetitions, you had a timer tick. So being careful with this. Um, the other thing is IPv6 on the left side has um, a higher hit ratio, which probably means, going back to our ARM problem before, um, it does more work, which is not too unsurprising. And if you look at the difference between BPF and BPF chit compared to turning BPF on, these tiny little changes here, you wonder how much the chit actually helps. So um, the one you could. Imagine you have, you've, you're doing this, you have 50 different microarchitectural and architectural numbers. They basically tell you all the same thing. The shit doesn't do much or doesn't help you much. Um, and you've tried different filters, different workloads, different packet sizes, all these things. So your conclusion gets to the point where can we get rid of the chit because it's a security thing as well in the kernel? We don't use it by default. Not commit the ARM version that was done. Um, can't find a workload. It has the limitations that it only works for a certain type of MBUFs, um, which by default for our receive path is not a problem, luckily, on real hardware. Um, and you keep looking at this while doing more analysis and you wonder, Where's the real difference? Where's this coming from? So you're splitting up kernel instructions, JIT instruction, and user space instructions, again, over your free architectures. In this case, I just picked um, the out of order pipeline. And if you just look at the kernel and user space bits and do visual pattern matching, you can see the numbers are kind of OK. They look reasonable and similar. There are slightly differences per architecture. And then you look at the kernel chit numbers, and you find this. So on ARM, you will find your chit has executed more than 2,000 or 5,000 instructions, depending on v6 or v8. Um, you've hit a lot of branches, which is kind of expected if you have a long filter list that is compar comparing a lot of things. But on x86, your numbers are not there. And you go back, pull out the instruction trace, and start reading the code. And you find it's doing the first four BPF instructions, and then it's returning. Can I tell you why at this point? Unfortunately, no, because the filter generation for this JIT is not in my traces, and I've not been able to rerun it yet. The other thing I've not been able to do, which I should really do, is take the same kernel, run it on real hardware, run TCP dump, and see if the packets I'm getting is only the packets I'm, I'm supposed to see. What it's currently doing, I can tell you but it's not right. <laughs> um, that leaves the question, 
Now, um, what's going to happen to the other implementations and what's the real conclusion? Interesting enough, the numbers we were looking at didn't show this. Um, I have worked in progress for similar things with both D-Trace and V-Image. Unfortunately, while I'm still speaking, the simulators are, and the analysis is still running. Um, but I had a bit of a talk with Mark before, and I used one of his patches um, to compare. So the original claim in the D-Trace paper was, as long as you don't use it, there's no overhead. Now, FreeBSD has two options for not using it. One is you don't compile it into the kernel, or as we do in generic since, I think, 11. Um, you have the hooks in, but you don't use it. And then the, my third thing is Mark's initial, well, latest patch at this point. For a V-image, it's basically doing the cost analysis because we want to turn it on in generic and want to understand where the cost comes from. So looking at D-Trace, and please correct me if I got this wrong, but generic is my understanding at the moment. For each SDT probe, we've got one global that says, is this probe enabled? If yes, take the branch, set up your arguments for the function call and everything, do the function call, and on return, undo. With your patch, the branch is gone. We still have the setup for the function call, and the, the undo, but there are knobs in there. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'd say they're not necessarily stack operations. Yeah, yeah, okay, register operations, and yeah. Right, and we were talking about a mixed version at one point, but um, that's for the future, which we don't have at this point. Um, it's working for x86. I've run it for ARM and ARMv8, but the results are not usable, so. Um, what you have is two values for a generic kernel. The first one is the plain kernel as all of us have it. The second version is with the patch. The same thing for a node D-trace kernel. And then you can ignore the v-image if you want, but the v-image is based on generic, so it should exhibit the same problems or the same behavior. And one of the things, given we removed the branch, um, that I've picked out of all of this is branch is retired and as you can see with the patch and generic yes a lot less branches executed sounds right there's a slight drop as well for the no trace case which would be interesting to understand where it's coming from given the entire setup is not there and this, it's the same kernel just plus the patch um, and the behavior is the same between both pipeline models. There's not much of a difference. So that seems to work as expected. Um, I've also picked out branch mispredicts only for the out of order pipeline model. And you see, number one, you have error bars, which is interesting. Number two, yes, the mispredicts go down. I mean, you have less branches, so less to mispredict. That is interesting. But in the no D-trace case, where nothing should change because none of the, if our if deaths for the kernel cover everything, nothing changes in what we compile in and out, the branch mispredicts suddenly go up. <laughs> this is again a, why does this happen? Is the uh, identical? Pardon? Is the binary identical? Because that's the case if the binary should be the same, right? Yeah, the binary is not, not the same. Um, you still get, um, that's a good question. Um, I guess I've, n I've not thought about comparing objects at this point. The thing I would do is go in and do a unique PC analysis, which is one of the things that is still running. Um, and I would, I would have loved to have the results for this, as in and see. Um, where do the additional um, PCs come from? Where, where do the additional PCs for the branch mispredicts in this spe specific case come from? But 
Similarly, you can do this if you go back for this tiny little bit of branches retired here. You would want to know that difference. So basically building up histograms of your, of your um, branches retired and compare them. But that's still going on. The image, um, funny enough, shouldn't affect any of our branch mispredicts really either because the only thing it does when compiled in is doing the extra layer of indirection. But apparently that is enough to change the behavior. And the funny thing is it's slightly less mispredicts than generic with the image turned on, which is like, why? <laughs> um, so there is more root cause analysis to be done, as in like go in, find out where these tiny little details come from. Um, one of the things we would love to do is measure those text builds as well. And then um, if we can, if anyone is interested in the lower bottom item, the to do item, finish ARMv8 and ARMv6 for the changes so we can actually compare those as well. Um, one more thing I want to look at, which hasn't happened yet, but will be interesting because it's the tool of measurement that we mostly use at this point is PMC. Um, and if you look at number one, what you would get is your default workload without PMC used or compiled in even. It's the same cases as with D-trace. But then um, you have areas between when you're calling PMC start and the MSRs are actually starting to count as in the entire lib PMC overhead and the HW PMC framework overhead. And you have that um, depending on whether you're counting or sampling in between as well. And then at, at the end again, and um, in one of the master classes in Cambridge, they found uh, on a low end arm a nice overhead of about 20% from adding PMC or starting to use PMC. And we'd like to reproduce this and see where it's coming from, which architectural or microarchitectural components are responsible for this. And then the other things you can do is compare the numbers at the end, as in is what your simulator will tell you the same number that your PMC framework will tell you? And depending on how interrupts are going to work um, in the simulator, what you could do is also do sampling mode and then compare ground truth, as in your workload without any PMC to every, say, 1,000 instructions to a sampling with PMC on and see if you find the same hotspots or not. So to summarize these bits, um, most of the work in the last 19 months has been to actually get this running. I found like it's a debugging tool for me by now that I don't want to miss anymore because you find something, if you can reproduce it, run it inside the simulator, get your ex, uh, ex instruction trace and everything out of it. Um, really great. For me, running experiments to do measurements, which is what I want to do, and instead finding bugs is really painful and annoying because it keeps me from doing the work I really want to do. Um, the other lesson learned is looking at the initial set of 50 different microarchitectural and architectural counters and numbers over these experiments gave us an idea of what we, you know, where to look. And by now, they're trying to use statistics to see which numbers are actually interesting to us. But the immediate question is where do these changes come from? Why is this the case? And you can't easily answer them with what you have. So this is the next level of digging into doing analysis on the traces that, I'm, that are currently running. Um, and that's getting 
closer to root cause analysis and with that try to automate this because printing these things out, staring at them for hours and trying to you know, make sense of them is something you want a computer to do for you if you can. Um, for me personally, I'm looking forward to do more fun things with this once my academic parts are over, but that'll have to wait a bit. Um, changing the software helps a lot, as in like in being able to just add tracing for all these components within three days or so um, helped. And I should probably say something about the resources. Um, one of the runs takes about 2.3 terabytes. I was out of disk space really uh, quickly because I have to keep these results at least until I'm done and everyone says, yes, you can forget about this. Um, and depending on the workload, it takes about three days at the moment to simulate and anal analyze. And Yes, it can be done a lot faster. The problem is, initially, the scripts that I started to write were parse these text files in order to see what's going on in terms of, like, is this thing actually working? These days, I would probably even start thinking of putting the output in databases and ask someone to write the nice shiny GUI. And when I saw the, um, what's your name? Debugging the debugger people yesterday, some of their, thank you. Um, when I saw some of the UIs, I thought like, yes, I'd love to have that. But um, at the moment, I have to write 60,000 words and that'll have to change a bit. So what needs to be done is at least fix the 1x86 TLB issue and resolve it, which means I need to sit down for a day and read Intel documentations and go back to Caustic and have the discussion and then figure out whether this is FreeBSD or the simulator and then dive in. So that goes another week or so just to fix this. Um, I've tried to keep most of the FreeBSD changes upstreamed. So whatever is in head apart from kernel config files, you don't have the BPF chits for ARM and ARMv8 from Ruslan yet, but Apart from that, everything is there. Gem 5, I still have changes on 120 <coughs> files and a couple of thousand lines of um, bug fixes and additions. If I get those out, one of the first thing is put everything in Jenkins so it doesn't break anymore because it is really painful to do. It's the same pain that you know if you do a major release update in FreeBSD for your own internal IP to follow gem 5 at times. Um, and the next thing is get multi-core running and they have a possibility to do EFO switch. So if you want to do network tracing, it'll become interesting in terms of having two simulators connected back to back and um, sending packets out. They have an E1000 simulation in there, which I've disabled by now because in between I've hit the first if lib box and yeah, I didn't want to deal with the fallout from that stuff. Um, and then go to the fun bits in terms of like get dwarf information. You've heard a lot about this yesterday. Same ideas basically. Um, say these cache hits and all these things that I have, what is responsible for them? Show me the operation in the source code where they are coming from. Um, Given we have the full information for the caches, we can see what's going in, what's getting evicted, where did it originally come from, so we can see who's battling with whom, and if it would, if we, we can go back in the trace and say, hey, this has just been evicted, but three fetches later, we just need this again, these kind of things. Um, you can do cost analysis in terms of, I had branch mispredicts, that means I had so many fetches, so many cache operations and all this, and then I decided I went wrong. I should have gone left instead of right. And you suddenly get the cost of all of this. Um, people, 
which change went in lately? Clebius committed the in-PCB change in terms of structural field layout changes because they were saying on our high-end Intel servers, for whatever they measured, I don't think I've seen numbers or anything. Um, they saw improvements by just shifting fields around, and this is something you could actually look at in all detail and understand using the simulator. And then one of the things I've not talked about is fidelity of the simulator results. Arm has published a paper on this at one point and said, yeah, you're within 20%. Internally, it is believed they have better models getting closer to reality. Um, for x86, I wouldn't put my hands into the fire at the moment. Um, that needs a very thorough comparison in terms of how close it is to real hardware. But um, the general trend seems to align with what's going on. Um, and then, yes, the interactive visualization display and assuming this is all working at some point, um, I would like to plug it into the FreeBSD CI integration framework and say, run it once a week, see how the numbers changes, and if they get worse, immediately do the analysis of like, what have we changed um, that causes the regressions, which is something we currently don't do, but I'm sure it'll happen at one point. Right. Questions? Yes? How much electricity does a three day simulation cost? <laughs> 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 um, I don't know. My CPUs are at 99.9 .9 or, or at times at 100 and something percent. I'm sorry, FreeBSD. Counting is not always good. Um, simulation is CPU bound despite writing so much trace data. Um, I have no idea about. S I have a couple of dedicated machines somewhere in a rack. No. So for the, 30, for the 36 different experiments, I'm using four machines. There are two different types of machines. Um, s two of them are running 12 experiments at a time in parallel because 12 cores, one tied to each core. As long as it's single core simulation, that's fine. Um, the others are six core, and they are getting the other 12. But. Um, Having more CPU power would be nice. Getting a faster CPU, currently no. So whatever high-end Intel it was when we started this, that's what it is. Does yeah. Try to simulate any CPU in particular, like for example, like this big node, like it has 256 ADX or it does breaks in the two operations internally, does it do like loop stream? Um, it doesn't do a CPU specifically. What I try to do is um, for the six different models I picked, like architecture pipeline, find a real machine that I can get my hands on and then replicate cache sizes for that, um, replicate cache timing, given you can, all, can tune all of this. Um, try to get it as close as I can and as much data sheets as I found but um, you could tune literally any interconnects and everything in there um, I've not tuned any of the CPU models themselves Good. In that case, um, thank you all. In case someone wants to try and get their hands dirty and run this, um, drop me an email. I'll send you the Gem5 patch. There's descriptions on the wiki on how to build it and how to run it. And then you can play around yourselves. 
Thank you.